Thanks. Hey, good morning. My name is Christina Dietrich. I'm the president of HR Partners, and I'm very excited uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you today about uh, how to hire, you know, talent. Uh, before I get into that, I want to make sure that everybody is aware that this is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit for ethics. So um, just keep that note. I'm assuming, is there a magic number that will be at the end of the, or something like that, or? No, automatic. Okay. Automatic, awesome. Okay, we got that taken care of. We always gotta get administrative things taken care of before we move forward. So what I wanna be able to accomplish to uh, with you today is to give you a lot of feedback on how to find the right people for your respective organization. Uh, one thing that I've noticed when I've uh, worked with your respective membership and when people have been uh, contacting me and asking me questions in the human resources arena, a lot of it has come back to this particular subject matter where they're saying uh, to me, how do you find people? How do you keep people? Or if I would have known some things about this person before I hired them, I wouldn't have hired them. So. I have been doing this for 30 years in the human resources field. I've hired thousands of people. And even before I had this respective company, I was the head of recruiting at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas. And the best way to describe why this uh, PowerPoint and these handouts I'm gonna be giving you are so awesome is because I've made a lot of mistakes. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when we make mistakes, we learn from those respective mistakes and we don't wanna go down that road again. So I laugh, this whole program is about things that have kind of gone this way and now I've got it on the front and center. So let's dig in. Let's talk about how we find good people. The first thing that you need to know, and I know this sounds silly, but if people don't know about you, if people don't know about your respective organization, it's very hard to recruit people. So I know you spend potential dollars, you know, in regards to uh, branding your particular organization, but you may go a step further and start branding yourself when it comes to be an employer of choice. So when you do that, when you're advertising or when you're basically going out there and looking for people to come join your organization and be employees for you, you need to look at these things. You need to share what your mission is. Sometimes I always say, <laughs> we've gotten so complicated on vision statements and mission statements. What are your values? What do you believe in as a company? Also, what are your, your benefits? You know, how do you serve your customers as well as, you know, what other qualities are you looking for in regards to, uh, you know, an employee joining your respective organization? Some other things in regards to branding, you know, logo, integrating your brand, making sure you have a tagline. I knew you probably thought, oh, I'm, I want to hear about hiring, but I'm telling you, I have a lot of clients in this particular market that they're having a hard time hiring people because nobody knows about them. So you need to get your website up to speed, get marketing materials up to speed, because not only are you selling to potential customers, you're also selling to potential employees who uh, can come and work for you. So that is the first thing that I wanted to share with you is to know about your branding and to make sure that you emphasize it when you start to go recruit. The next thing, and you guys are gonna laugh about this, uh, yeah, I have a little turtle there, and it says, hire slow, fire fast. Because a lot of people do just the opposite. They basically hire really fast and then take forever to sever the relationship with someone. And so what I'm saying here is, have you ever heard the terms, you snooze, you lose? That's true with recruitment. I mean, I don't wanna drag it on forever, but all I'm saying here is you need to do your due diligence. 
go a little extra mile in regards to the due diligence and I have given you a checklist and if you stick to that respective checklist you're going to find the right person because you did the hire slow and then the fire fast. First thing you do when you have an opening is you need to get that word out. Now, a lot of people ask me, what do you do first though, before you basically go out and you look for someone? Just like any organization, and I'm trying to look for people myself on my respective organization, you need to do some analysis. Like for example, if you, and a lot of you that I've talked uh, to in the membership at KAIA, a lot of you are dealing with people that are retiring, or people that have been with the organization a long time. So these are some of the analysis that you need to do when you're in that category, when you're dealing with someone that's been with the organization a long time. You need to look at the organizational structure or the chart and look at their duties. Usually what happens when you're working with someone that has been with your organization for years and years and years is they have taken on more things over time that you're not gonna find someone who can basically replace all those pieces of the puzzle. So you might be putting it in different areas with different people, and then you're gonna be restructuring that particular position before you go out to the market to see if you can find someone. So that's the first thing, is before you go out, you have to look at the organizational structure and maybe tweak your job description before you go out there. The second thing is, and you guys are going to laugh about this, have you done exit interview data? Did that person leave or are you continuing to have people leave your organization because of problems within your organization? I'll give you an example. I deal a lot of times with organizations where they're going, hey, Christina, you know, I hire people in and they, they're out within 90 days. It's just like a revolving door. And then I start asking questions and then I find out that they're not paying what the market needs to pay. Oh, they forgot to tell them they're only going to be, you know, prorated on pay, you know, for this amount of work. Or, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you the person that's the supervisor of those folks over there, uh, no one gets along with them. Uh, they're not a really nice person and they're very challenging to work with. So why I bring this up is I don't like to set people up to fail. If you've got a problem internally, fix that internally before you bring people into the system because you're just going to continue to be doing it over and over again and expecting uh, different results. I kind of laugh. I love the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's how I feel about that. So make sure you know why people are leaving because you need to fix it before you bring them in. Also the rest of this, this is pretty standard stuff. We already talked about the job description. If you were to call me tomorrow and say, hey, Christina, I need an accountant. Can you help me? I'd say, absolutely. Do you have a job description? We got to have a job description before we go out to the market because you want to be very transparent with the market, what you're looking for. So you have to have that updated. Also, you need to know what you're going to pay someone. Uh, a lot of people know, okay, I'm going to pay this range or I'm going to do this hourly or salary, you know, rate. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a business decision on your part. Uh, what you want to do in that arena, but you've got to be ready with that because I hate to say it, it is what it is. This is a business and at some point in time, they're going to want to know what you're paying. So I get, a, I get this question a lot. Should I advertise what I'm paying? Normally I don't. And I'm not saying that's good or bad to do it that way, but usually I do bring that up pretty quickly within the recruitment process system, and we'll talk about that later. But when it comes to advertising, what you're going to be paying, I tend to not be in that camp to do that. Uh, the only time I've done that is, I'm going to be honest with you, that I tend to do that when it's sometimes a little bit lower than the market. So you tell people up front that you're only doing $12 an hour instead of $15 an hour. So they know up front 
that that's what the pay is. So that's a business decision on your part, but I tend to be in the camp. I don't advertise it, but I talk about it very quickly in the system and we'll discuss that. And then the last but not least is about a benefit summary sheet. Uh, I have a client in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and she um, didn't have one of those. And it's very important. It's kind of a part of your branding and your marketing, but a really good candidate is not only gonna wanna see a job description, but they're gonna wanna see a benefit summary sheet. Now a benefit summary sheet is not complicated. <laughs> Don't make this complicated. You basically are putting on one piece of paper all the benefits that you offer within your organization. So the health insurance, the life insurance, the disability, the PTO, the holiday pay, anything that you want to promote beyond the compensation within that benefit summary sheet, that's what we wanna see. Now, I talked a little bit about, you know, what you need to do to get ready to get out to the market, but here are some things that you can do on an ongoing basis in regards to finding good people. I do the very top portion of that. If you see, you know, the educational resources like high schools and Votex and student chapters, in fact, I'm gonna be contacting, and I've worked with them in the past, K-State and Washburn University has student chapters of human resources professionals. And so I like to uh, hire people right out of those institutions um, that want to be in the respective field that I wanna be in and de develop them from there. So that's an, uh, that's an idea, as we call it in our world, proactive resources of people that you have a pool of people that you go back to on an ongoing basis. In fact, we do have a legal side of the business and uh, I'll be interviewing with my husband because he's the attorney and I'm the HR person. We are gonna be uh, basically interviewing two interns from the law school tomorrow in regards to joining our respective organization. Now, in a perfect world, I'd love them as an intern, but I'd also love to see them once they graduate from law school and pass that bar exam to be a part of our organization. So please keep in mind educational institutions. I'm gonna go down and the other thing I'm gonna talk about because it's been a hot subject is I call it referral bonuses as well as sign-on bonuses. Uh, a referral bonus, we do this a lot in recruitment where we basically uh, pat our employees on the back if they give us a good referral source. Uh, the only question or the only suggestion I have is let's say you do a $500 uh, referral bonus to anyone internally that basically offers a good person up to be a part of our team. What I've found is it's more beneficial to pay that out maybe in two payments or wait until that respective uh, new employee has been with the organization a certain length in time. So don't do it immediately. Here's the other thing that's really hot right now because it's we have an interesting market, is a sign-on bonus. I'm cool with sign-on bonuses, but here is what I've seen happen with not only entry-level positions that are getting sign-on bonuses, as well as I had an engineer the other day with one of our engineering firms where they gave him $10,000 sign-on bonus. Hey, that's a nice sign-on bonus. No wonder, he, I mean, he wanted to work for this respective organization. But here's where both of them failed. They didn't have anything structured in regards to, you know, overtime or if for some reason they pull out or they don't fulfill their commitment that they owe the organization that money back. Um, so if you wanna talk more about these two things and how you structure them, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. But I'm just telling you that seems to be a hot subject and it's great to get people in the door, but you know the, the, the uh, jury is still out in regards to if it creates the long-term success that you want it to. And then the last thing, and I know many of you are struggling with this, you gotta get into technology. 
when it comes to uh, applications, meaning even myself, I'm a small company. I have five employees, but I have a way for people to do uh, an application online. With this new generation that is coming up, not only our millennials, but our Generation Z people, they, they, I mean, if they're going to be probably taken aback if you actually send them a written application form. <laughs> so I want to really emphasize to you, applicant tracking databases or how you do applications online is very easy to administer and it's very cost effective. Even me, an HR professional, I have something that costs 60 bucks a month, 60 bucks a month online. It's a link. They go onto my website and they can apply for jobs. You can do the same thing as well, too. So those are the three things proactively that I, I'd like you to work on, you know, when it comes to getting ready for recruiting and recruiting, you know, the next generation. Next thing, how do we source candidates? This is how we source them. We need to basically, you know, do some level of a, a job advertisement. You need to basically educate us about your organization, educate us on what you're looking for, the qualifications, and how people can apply. The other thing uh, that is big, depending on the size of your organization, let your respective employees know internally that you're looking. They will be your best resource. When I was at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas, we always, no matter what was open in our organization with them, now they're a large company across the, the state, we always went internally. And we always did electronically. We sent out a job posting. It was basically internal for one week for uh, one week. But you know what was great about that? When we, you send something electronically to someone, they can forward it on as well too. So keep that in mind that when even me, our small company, when I said that I was gonna start looking, I let my staff know because they're gonna be great recruiters for us as well. I'm big on free advertising. I don't know about y'all, do you like the word free? I like the word free. Free is a good word. There is no, there is no reason to spend a lot of money to find people online, okay? So these are some of the free resources. And I even have more. If you want to know other job boards, I can let you know. But we developed, you know, an email distribution list. Your customers are really good for helping you in regards to a position opening. I bet you have a distribution list, an email distribution list. Send that out to them. Say you're looking for someone. Also, social media is great. I, when we blog out, we do Facebook, we do LinkedIn, we do, we tweet it out as well too. I laugh because if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, it's funny with anything, the infrastructure is there now that we just type it in once and it goes to all social media all at the same time. All the job boards are good, but I'm afraid the one that is still dominant is indeed.com. Now, the one thing that I want you to know about indeed.com is a couple of things. You don't have to pay for Indeed. A lot of people are paying and you don't have to. You have to strategically post and repost that position on a semi-regular basis in order to get out of that getting charged on a regular basis. And we can help you with that if you have uh, problems. Here's the other thing you need to be aware of. They have gotten very strict with their, um, I call it screening mechanism. So if you basically say, I'm looking for someone with a college degree and 10 years of experience, and you post that, they are gonna screen it for you, okay? So if you've been wondering, like, why am I not getting any applications? you might be uh, being screened out, so to speak. So we figured that out and how to disengage that so you can see the full scope of who is applying for your particular position. So just want you to know there's some tweet, you know, so there's some weird things going on with Indeed and it's not you. And if you need some help, 
But I'm, I'm telling you, that seems to be still the most prominent, dominant place to apply. So you need to get that figured out if you want to find people. Um, we've already talked about applicant tracking databases, but you also need to advertise on your website. And here's why. Very intelligent um, folks that are in the market and want to work for a, a new organization are going to do their research. And they're going to go to your respective website. And if your opportunity is not on that website, they're probably going to be wondering why not. And so they may be a little bit curious on what the heck is going on. So just an FYI on that one that uh, you need to put it on your website as well, too. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. I just like water every now and then. So don't panic. I'm still here. Here's the next thing. If. Remember when I said free? Well, sometimes you need to spend money. And if you need to spend money, this is what I spend money on. In my world, um, if you're in a certain industry, they have their own websites. Like I'm a part of Society for Human Resources Management. If I want to post on their website, it's going to cost me money. So um, not only the local chapters, but maybe even the statewide or the national. So if you're going to spend money, Make sure you spend your dollars wisely and look within um, the arena of the industry. Even with administrative assistance, there are, you know, statewide or even local chapters within that field. So not a lot of people know that, but I'm very familiar with a lot of uh, industry-based advertising mechanisms. Also, people do ask me, what about uh, newspapers or periodicals? I'm not anti, you know, you can't do that because some of my local markets, like if I'm up in Marshall County or Nemaha County or Coffee County, they have the local, you know, paper and, and they, they still find it very effective. That's awesome. Do, do what you need to do. But many of these periodicals also have an online component. So if you do put something in their newspaper, they will give you three days or 30 days online as well, too. So you can basically get two things running in parallel. So know that you have that option. OK, we have advertised. It is out there. Here comes the applications in. So how do you start organizing the applications to see who you want to talk to and who you don't want to talk to. Here's, here's the pile system. Even though we're so sophisticated here, it's still about the piles. <laughs> Two piles, qualified and not qualified, okay? That's how you start. But then once you get the qualified pile in order, here's what I really look at. There's two things that are very important to me when I look at that qualified pile. The first one is, no offense, I look at their tenure. I look at how long they have been at other respective positions. Now, the big debate here is how long is long enough? And when it comes to a salaried or a professional position, three to five years is what I'm looking for. And why am I looking for that? That shows me that they were there long enough to make a difference within that respective uh, position and organization. Now, the challenge is sometimes with hourly positions or more entry-level positions, and honestly, I'm pretty happy if I can see at least a year. So just know that the days of 20, 25, 30 years are not what you're going to find. And I hate to say it, sometimes those folks are dangerous, <laughs> and I mean this lovingly, but you know, once you've been in a role 20, 25, 30 years, it's very hard for you to flex to another organization. So just because they have that level of tenure and they have that level of loyalty, know that it may be challenging for them to come over to your respective organization. Okay, that's one thing that I look at is tenure. The second thing that I look at is similarity in regards to industry. So long story short, what does that mean? 
if I've always been in a professional work environment, like an office environment, and I'm working Monday through Friday, you know, uh, eight to five, I may be challenged going to a manufacturing firm that is 24 seven. That's what I mean by that, is people tend to like to go to similar type of work environments that they have done in the past. Here, let me give you another uh, example. Sometimes people are challenged when they come work for me because we're a small shop and you have to wear multiple hats. And they were at a corporate environment or a government environment where they were just a slice of the pie. That's another thing that you need to look at is how are they gonna fit in and how much of a stretch is it gonna be to come to your respective organization? So that's what I look for to basically make the decision. And as you can see on the screen, I phone screen people. I do not even bring them in for a face-to-face -face interview until we've had a discussion over the phone on a couple of items. And you can see some of the important things that I'm looking for is here's where the pay comes out. I can't emphasize this enough. Ask them this question. Ask them what their minimum salary requirements are. What are they looking for to be happy? Now, most of the people answer that question for me. Every now and then I get someone that says, oh, that's negotiable and all of that. And I tell them, I go, well, I apologize, but the answer is no to that. I got to know what you're looking for to see if we're even compatible, because why go to the next level and the next level and the next level when I'm going to pay you a lot less? So it's one of those, I people always are like amazed, but it's a business question. And honestly, a lot of people answer it, and then we know right away if we're compatible or not. The other thing that we sometimes ask is if this is a second shift position or working from home or it's a hybrid, you know, we want to know uh, what they're looking for because if it's coming into the office and they want to work from home, this may not be a good match. But ask them first a question so you can get their answer. Don't spoon feed them in any way what you're looking for. Please do not do this. Please do not say, we're remote, we are remote. Is that okay with you? They will say yes. Oh, we're at the office every day. Do you have any problems being at the office? Don't do it that way. Ask it this way. Ask it where, hey, there's many different work environments out there, remote, hybrid, you know, office environment. What's your preference? Which one would you like to work for? And see what they say. And then the last thing is, in my world, I ask three questions on the phone screen, but these three questions are based upon what I'm looking for. The three things that I'm looking for with a good HR professional, they've got to have great written communication skills. They've got to have awesome time management. And you're going to love my last one. They have to be professionally mature. Oh, let me take a sip on that one professionally mature. You guys are going to laugh, but a lot of people say to me, what does professionally mature mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that, you know, when you're in a respective office environment and you're working with clients or you're working with members or customers, you're not always going to get your way <laughs> and you got to be able to, you know, handle that appropriately. Uh, I'm looking for someone, honestly, that's anti-drama. I don't have drama in my life, and I like to be around people that don't have drama in their life. Not to say that we don't experience it, but it's one of these where that's what I mean by professionally mature. Um, so I ask questions to see if they have these things. Now, people might ask, okay, well, how can you ask a professional maturity question? Here's what I ask. When was the last time that you received constructive criticism? When was the last time you received constructive criticism? What was it? And what have you done in order to change it? So it's one of these where do your due diligence, do a phone screen before you do the face-to-face. -face. Because a lot of times when I do a phone screen, I don't 
I, we don't need to talk face to face. We know we're compatible or we're not compatible. So, okay, because I didn't know if anyone's chatting with me or asking questions, so we'll do that. Okay, I know this sounds silly, but a lot of people uh, don't do employment applications. Uh, I just had a client just before I came here. He's got an accountant that he wants to hire for his organization, and he's got a resume, but he wants to know where do we go from here. You need to do an employment application, and you also, what's with that employment application is a written authorization form to do background checks. So I can't tell you, this gives me a lot of power and gives you a lot of power to know more information and follow up to make sure that information is accurate when it comes to, you know, this person and whether or not they're a good fit. I don't care if you're the only person, the business owner, you need to have other people interview this person, even myself, these interns that I'm basically interviewing tomorrow, I'm doing the pre-screening, I'm gonna talk to them, but our staff are, are gonna be very much involved in this process. And here's why, this new person on my team is gonna work with me maybe five to 10% of the time. The team is gonna work with them 90% of the time. So they are bigger decision makers even than myself. And I think mo more business owners need to have that res respective attitude. It will allow a little bit more on team camaraderie if they're involved in the process as well too. Here's some uh, tips on the face-to-face -face interview. Are they on time? If they're not on time for the interview, what is that telling you? They're telling you they're not gonna be on time ever. Uh, so I know I'm really cold hearted, but uh, I've had maybe in my career, 10 people show up late to an interview and I just go out and I thank them and, and th that's the end of it. I don't even waste my time. I know that sounds harsh, but uh, here's why I do that. Um, sometimes I potentially could be late to appointments, but I always call. I always call. In fact, I was, I had to go from one client in one county to another client in another county. I was going to be one minute late, one minute late, but I called. I called like 10 minutes before that one minute late to let them know I was running late. So, I'm just big on time management. And so if they're not on time, that's telling you something. Make sure the aesthetics are correct when you're having this meeting, meaning you're in a neutral territory. You're not, you know, uh, sometimes when people interview people in offices, they're like the dominant person on one side and the, uh, the person that they're interviewing is on another side, not good. You really don't want to bring them to your office because if you came to my office, there's way too much information in my office that uh, someone could use uh, to basically distract the interview itself. So that's why you want to be in a neutral territory. And then you need to be confidential. You don't want to have it in an open space. I tend to not be the type of person that likes to do it too much in coffee shops not with the initial first interview. So make sure you get those aesthetics right. Be prepared, have those questions ready, don't wing it. And then here's the key. This is the number one thing that leaders do wrong in an interview. They talk too much. They talk and they talk and they talk. And, and the candidate doesn't talk at all. Here's even me, I was guilty of this when I first started my business. I would basically have someone come in, we'd chit chat, I'd have a couple questions, but then I'd tell them all the things that I'm looking for and they say, yeah, I can do that. And then I'd find out they can't do that. So long story short, I tell people when they first come into the interview, I say, look, I've got a lot of questions for you. I'm gonna ask you these questions and then once they ask, you know, I ask these questions, then I know we are in sync or we're not in sync. And then we go from there. Here are the best questions that I ask in an interview. And here you're gonna laugh. If you ask this, you're gonna find out if you're getting the right fit. 
look at their resume, look at their application. Let's say they've had three positions. Go to that former employer and say, hey, what did you like about that job and what did you not like about that job? So if I'm, I'm interviewing an HR person and I say, hey, what'd you like about that job? They would say, oh man, I love the training. I love uh, doing the employee relations. I love doing mediation. I'm like, okay, well, what did you not like about that job? Oh, I hated the compliance. I hated doing all those job descriptions, those policy revisions. I just didn't like that. That's just not my thing. Well, guess what? What they hated about that last job is what I really need at my job. <laughs> so I just got a heads up that there's gonna be challenges. And it's amazing if you ask that. It's always amazing too when I say, hey, would you like about that job? Would you not like? And they always go, hey, I didn't like my boss. Well, guess what? You're probably not gonna like me either because I'm a boss. <laughs> so always be kind of skeptical of people that say that they don't like their boss. You're gonna have to zone, I mean, I'm not saying that we all haven't had issues with our respective you know, employers, but at the end of the day, that's a red flag and that's why you have to ask those particular questions. The other thing that I talk about is follow through. Meaning after you do the interview, I always tell people, hey, I'm gonna make a decision in the next two weeks. So you know, I will be calling you and letting you know if you got it or you didn't get it. And that's another thing that I'm big on folks. I have called tons of people in my career and told them that they didn't get the job. And you know what, that's paid back to me in dividends. Uh, I still get compliments for people that they didn't get the job, but they appreciated the phone call. So how do I do that? I don't call everybody in a job file, but if they came in and visited with me or they did a phone screen with me and they took time out to be with me, I, I feel like they deserve the professional courtesy of a callback. And I know you guys are just like me. We're in small communities, people talk, and I don't want them to say that I never followed up with them. So be sure to follow up. Okay, you're gonna find out, this is my favorite slide of the whole presentation. And in another life, I would have been a private investigator. I don't know about y'all, but I like that true crime. Do you guys like true crime? I know I like true crime. And one thing that no one does, or very rarely do small employers do, is background checks. And I could tell you story after story after story how background checks have saved an organization. And it's because, I hate to say it, when people do have issues within their employment past, um, you know, they need to look into those respective folks. Uh, you guys are going to kind of be taken aback by this, but the number, uh, one of my top three things that are happening right now uh, with my employers that people are getting fired uh, for is embezzlement, stealing. They are getting pretty sneaky in regards to that. So if you're hiring someone that's going to be in charge of your money or in charge of your accounting, you know, maybe doing a credit check and doing some professional references would be in order. So all of these that are listed here are background checks that you need to possibly look into. Now, drop dead. What are the two that I have to have? No matter what someone does is a criminal background check and you do need to do professional references. And I can even help you with both of those meanings. They do cost money, but not a lot of money. To do a KBI, if the person's only lived in Kansas, that's around 25, 20, 25 bucks. If you wanna do a motor vehicle record, if they're basically driving your company vehicles, I think it's $15. So if you wanna know how much these are, they're very, very easy to administer. Don't just Google people. I mean, you can only find out so much with Google, but you can get into their respective court records, their open records. But once you get that written authorization form and get that information, you can do a background check. Okay. Another level, and I do this, and some of my, probably half of my clients do this, is 
Okay, you did background checks. And before I do the second interview with someone, I have them take a, a personality assessment. There's two types of assessments you can give them. Assessment number one is a skills-based assessment. If they say they know Word really well or Excel, or they know, need to know if they desktop publishing, they know that, where there's ways to test on that to make sure that they have that skill set. And then the last one is a personality assessment. Um, I have hired some major superstars in my past and HR. And the uh, personality assessment that I used, I started using a Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas. It's called uh, Profiles XT. There's a million of them out there. They're all good. But it's one of these that I like that one the best because it nails people. I've taken it. I know what my you know, strengths and challenges are. But now that I've hired all these superstars over the years, I've benchmarked it. And now when someone comes in to uh, work for me, I know if they're hitting the benchmark or not. Not only do I know if they're hitting the benchmark or not, then I have to make a business decision. Is that something I can coach or not coach? They're telling me not only their intellect, they're also telling me their behavioral traits. So it's funny, it's worth the extra money you know, to do it. Because you now know, not only do uh, I've looked, done these background checks, but I also know they're the right personality fit within our organization. Hey, the other cool thing about the one that I use, it, te it tests the person and it gives you interview questions based upon how they scored. So it gives you some more you know, clout with them to know why they scored the way they scored. So I'm just telling you, it's worth it. I already talked about you got to have a second interview. No one, no one should come into your organization until you've seen them at least twice, either with your team or in a more casual environment. So sometimes people, I tend to like the more structured interview first. And then the second time that they come in, I like to basically uh, see them in a more casual environment, such as a cup of coffee or a lunch. So. That's my opinion, but I found out that you find out a little bit more, and sometimes people even make changes based upon that. Okay, one more level. Sometimes people do job shadowing uh, before they come on board. This has worked with some of the organizations that I partner with, where before you make a decision, come and shadow us for half a day, and see if this is the type of uh, organization that you wanna work for. Sometimes people make the business decision to bring them in as a contractor first before they make them a W-2 employee. So both of those are options. You have to make the business decision if that's the right one for you. Okay, I have talked to some of you out there where you're very similar to me and uh, meaning we have client lists, we have confidentiality we wanna protect, maybe we want a non-compete or a non-solicitation. So once you hire this person, there's two things that you have choices on. Choice number one is you need to solidify the offer in a letter. We call them offer letters. And it's basically you know, putting uh, together what you've basically agreed upon with this new employee, their compensation, their benefits, maybe it's their you know, vacation rate, whatever that is. That is one way to do it. But I will say in certain businesses, uh, you know, if you wanna go above and beyond, all my staff sign off on employment agreements. They're still employment at will. They can leave me whenever they want, and I can, I can do the same thing. I can sever the relationship as well too. But what that employment agreement is doing is protecting my intellectual property. And it's very specific, you know, uh, in regards to not competing against the business, not taking my material that we've developed and it's protecting that as well as non-solicitation. They can't leave with all you know my employees and my intellectual property and they can't even go work for certain clients and 
there is a stipulation in regards to how much those clients bring into the business. I always, when I'm interviewing people, tell them up front that they're going to sign this. I even show them what it looks like so they know 100% what they're signing. Now, people always ask me this because I'm, you know, married to an attorney and, and I've worked with non-competes a lot. They go, well, are they really valid? And the answer is yes. But I will say this, you need to be reasonable with your, you know, uh, your stipulations on non-compete and non-solicitation. Most are a year to two years. If you get beyond two years, you're not gonna get very far with the respective courts. But I will say most people honor them. If they know they signed a non-compete, most people honor them. I've only dealt with uh, maybe a handful to 10 cases in 14 to 15 years where they were challenging those respective non-competes. I, I laugh, we just, one of our clients up in Northeast Kansas, now this is a different business, but it is uh, optometrists and they wanna release the person you know, from their non-compete. And so we're working to, to do that, to get the documentation together for them in order to do that. So I wanted you to know that that is an option and you can see that on this you know, particular slide. So I just know that I have discussed with some of you out in the membership because the, the breakup was bad. And I go, well, we can alleviate future breakups if you basically stipulate upfront what it's all about. Okay, I've already talked about this but please contact the people that are selected and non-selected. You don't wanna burn any bridges. And then last but not least, please be there their first day. <laughs> I know I'm so shallow. Uh, the number one complaint I get from new employees, uh, and just so you guys know, the most critical time for a new employee is within the first 90 days. But I get a lot of pushback or you know feedback from new employees where they showed up, the boss wasn't there, the computer wasn't set up, no one's there to help them, train them. I, I don't know about y'all, but that just doesn't sound very friendly to me. So I'm the type of person, if you saw my calendar, it's out of control. But if I have a new employee, the world is going to stop and I'm going to make sure that I'm there the full day and accessible to them to make sure that I'm answering all those questions. And then I'm going to make sure that one of my team members is going to be their mentor besides me to help them in anything that they need. So just know that you can work your butt off and get the best people ever. But if you don't have a plan for them in regards to orientation and onboarding, they may be out the door really, really quick. So it's one of these. Now, those are my tips. And now, now that I've given my tips, <laughs> I've given a lot of tips. Dave wants to talk to you. He's got a slide here to basically talk. So there you go. Go, so Dave. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the great presentation. Um, the one thing I want to do is just make sure that our members are aware of some of the resources that we have to help you in the area of hiring, training, and retaining talent. And so there are some member resources available. Uh, the first one I'd ask you to check out is Big Eye Hires, BigEyeHires.com. And included in Big Eye Hires, there's resources for helping you recruit uh, people. We have ideal traits that we offer that allows you to, as Christina alluded to, a applicant management system. It also allows you to create a job posting and goes out and crawls the web and gets those job postings placed in a number of different places. Um, we also have another product that's through the big eye, but KAIA has off, also partnered with a company called Career Plug, which offers very much similar uh, services to what Ideal Trace offers. It's a little bit cheaper, and then it also allows you to create a free web page on your website to advertise jobs, and that also feeds a KAIA job board on our website. 
So those are two resources in helping you uh, go out and get talent. There's also um, something that was specifically created for our industry called the DIY, uh, DIY Hiring Toolkit, which provides job descriptions, applications, and interview questions specific to the industry. And I, Christina, I know you've supplied mm -hmm. us with some mm -hmm. of those materials, uh, but this is another thing that's specific to our industry that you can utilize. In the area of assessments, you alluded to it as mm -hmm. well. There are a ton of assessments mm -hmm. out there. Uh, the Big Eye specifically utilizes Caliper, and there's some discounted pricing for our members for that. There is another uh, resource out there that I find particularly interesting, and that is something called a sales reluctance assessment. It's actually not training, but an assessment to identify those that may be reluctant if they're in a sales role, which I think is an important thing as well. As far as a staffing resource we offer, if, if we offer a um, program through WAVE, Work at Home Vintage Experts. And these are folks that have been in the insurance industry for 20, 30 years that aren't necessarily ready to retire, but they're ready to cut back. So uh, our members get a dis discounted pricing when utilizing um, WAVE. We personally here at the association through ASK have two WAVE employees and I can tell you um, it's been the best decision that we've ever made. And I hear from our members that utilize WAVE um, that they love it. And the reason they love it is that they can get somebody with 20 to 30 years experience that is living where they want to live, working the hours they want to live, and they really don't want to screw that up. So um, they, they bring a lot of expertise and commitment to the job. So those are the resources, and obviously mm -hmm. come back in here, Christina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other resource that I want to make sure you're aware of is that we have partnered with Christina's HR Partners firm that you can uh, reach out to her with any of your HR consulting questions. So we'd encourage you to reach out to Christina mm -hmm. with, with all of mm -hmm. your needs and mm -hmm. uh, lean on her because uh, I think when the pandemic came around, there was a lot more need to have that expertise. And right. then with the great resignation, people are looking for talent all of the time. So uh, leaning on you and, and help getting some guidance is a good thing. So anything, any parting shots? No, no. And, and I will say the respective membership, the best way to get a hold of me is to email me. And um, it is my name, Christina, K-R-I-S. I think it's on the last slide there. there you go. Hello. Yeah. I usually like to do that at the very end. But uh, hey, we are really good. Every time uh, a member has basically reached out to us and had any HR question, uh, we get back to them that same business day. So do not be afraid to reach out. We'll let you know if we can help you or not, but 90, 90, 95%, we've been able to get it taken care of right away. So just email us. Awesome. I'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you for joining us today. Again, this, this qualified for one CE credit of ethics. Is there a question that came There's in? probably a question. Carlin? Oh, no. No? Uh, it was about uh, polls. There were no polls this hour. Um, as long as you were logged in the entire time, we will okay. uh, file your CE for you. Correct. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And reach out to KAIA if you need anything at all. Thank mm -hmm. you. Awesome. Thank you.